Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, can we just go ahead and give the Lord a hand? Amen. We hope that you had an awesome uh, Thanksgiving. I know that for uh, every single person in this room, Thanksgiving could mean different things. For some of you, uh, it's spaghetti as opposed to turkey and dressing. Uh, for some of you, it's uh, awkward family moments, tension, drama. For others of you, you go, it's one of the favorite times of the year. It's a thing that we remember all the time. Uh, for us, we, uh, we love Thanksgiving, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to spend time with our family and uh, to also thank God for the things that he's done in our lives. But this last week, uh, we did a table talk discussion with uh, my parents, and so Kelly and I got the, the honor and the privilege of being able to sit down for, uh, with them for about an hour and a half. We did this last Tuesday uh, on a brief webinar. It's still available on our Facebook page. If you haven't seen it, we talked through just a lot of the challenges uh, in our family uh, in terms of some of my dad's, you know, he's a coach in Texas, has lost a couple of jobs and won lots of games, lost to lots of games. Uh, but we talked about just life, about how they came to faith. And one of the things that struck me most as I was preparing for this message today it was not about the wins and the losses, not about the hardships, the trials, not about the injury uh, that he faced uh, in his own personal journey a couple of years ago and kind of him learning some new things as a result of that. But one thing that struck me is that my dad grew up in a Presbyterian home and he was a part of confirmation classes and he realized at the age of 11 or 12 that there was not a whole lot of meaning in what was being taught to him in terms of Christ being the preeminent of scriptures, and he just realized that it wasn't real life-giving. Then he, met, he meets this girl, and this girl comes from a home as well that uh, their family didn't go to church, ever. Maybe once a year if they were lucky. And not only did they not go to church, but her, her dad was an alcoholic and just wasn't present, wasn't at home, uh, was demeaning, and, and would say that he loved them and occasionally would do things, didn't even give her away at her wedding. That's my mom. And you have these two people who their lives come together, and when they're in high school, about a year apart, they come to faith in Jesus. And as a result of that, they begin to live faithful lives. When my dad was in the hospital in a coma state a couple of years ago, a guy from his high school that played with him showed up and he began to share the testimony of my dad. And he said, I remember after your dad became a Christian, he said he would ride on the varsity bus and he would carry his Bible with him. And he said, and he, he was a pillar back then. And I asked my dad about that just this last week uh, before the interview. I go, hey, just tell me about that. And he goes, oh, I don't remember any of that, you know. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I was going to give you an opportunity to share with him. He goes, I, I don't remember that. He goes, I do remember God changed my life and I wanted to be faithful to him. But what struck me most about this, and, and I'm not giving you a plug to go back and watch it because it was as meaningful to me as it would be anyone here, and here's why. is because the only reason I'm standing here today is because of the work that God did in two people's lives who were not believers. And I want to, in a sense, encourage you before we dive into a, a, the word in which I think will convict most of us in this room, I want to encourage you first and foremost to help you understand that when you give your life to Jesus and you become a part of a new covenant of believers through the hope of Christ, you're a guardian to those underneath you. And you're a guardian in the sense that you, you were commissioned by God to raise people who would love and serve God. And for some of you, you go, I, I really struggle with that. Here's the hope. I want you to realize that becoming the pillar of the faith is something that happens over time. And even if you look back and you say, I'm a first-generation Christian like my parents, that it can still be done. And that's really the hope for today, is that if you and I, as we close this series today, are going to be a mission-minded family, and we're going to have conversations around tables, maybe it's not a table talk conversation, maybe it's a couch conversation, whatever you want to call it. If you're going to talk about these things, then then you're going to have to realize God's place in your life and, and who he is. Andy Stanley, a pastor of North Point Community Church in uh, Georgia, he said, the greatest contribution you may ever make to the kingdom is not something you do, but someone you raise. 
And if you can realize that, that the greatest contribution that you may ever make is the ministry that doesn't come from you, but comes from one of your children, it's huge. I had a guy who came up to me after the service, and he goes, I'm so thankful for your parents and their testimony. And he goes, because if God changed your life, he changed mine. And you're like, oh my goodness, Lord, thank you. That's what it's about. And so I want you to realize that today is, I think, very important in this series. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 78 as we dive in. And I think six fundamental things that you'll see very clearly from the scriptures. They're, they're not a stretch. I'm not having to manipulate the text in any way. They're very clear. Fundamental things that you and I should apply as parents, as grandparents, wherever it is that we are. Even as a single, you can still be mission-minded. I want to realize this message is not just for the cute little family who has three kids, a nice little dog named Skippy, and a beautiful home. Like this, this idea of mission-minded is wherever you are, Maybe you're in a stage where you're a grandparent. Maybe you're in a stage where you're looking to get married. Maybe you're in a stage where you got three little kids running around. You're like, I don't even know how to teach them or train them. I don't have a clue how to make a difference in their lives. Today, we're going to tell you how, and we're going to give you some practical tools in doing it, but you have to realize what God's called you to do. So Psalm 78, you got this guy named Asaph. Asaph is a, a singer in the days of King David and King Solomon. Uh, he's a guy that you'll see from the, the Old Testament who... Uh, has some prominence and and obviously a giftedness to sing and to write. And he writes this maskal. This maskal is a proverb. And he's going going to say, I've got something to say to the people of Israel. And I want to remind you of a few things. And what he's going to do is he's simply going to say, I want to remember how God has been gracious to us in spite of our failures. And if you know anything about Israel, you'll realize they were a bunch of knuckleheads. They were boneheads, meaning... God would tell them to do something. They'd go, okay, we're going to do it. And about eight minutes later, they either forgot or just chose outright disobedience. And they didn't do it. And we look at Israel and we go, man, they were foolish, out and ignorant. And in some ways, it gives us a little puffed up confidence because we think, oh, we got it together. But I want you to realize that we are very similar in many ways, that we hear what God says, we know what he wants for us to do, and we just don't do it. It's James 1.22. We, we hear the word and then we deceive ourselves and we don't do what it says. And so the goal today is to not just hear it and go, oh, that's a really good message. Man, that's a, six things that I think we can do. No, it's six things to take to heart and begin to implement wherever it is in our stage of life. Why? Because we remember this maskal of Asaph. Asaph goes, I want you to remember how God has been gracious to Israel in all of our failures. The goal of of, of Psalm 78 is not to, to beat the people down and say, hey, you were a failure. You were a failure. You were a failure. It was to go, no, God was good to us in the midst of our failures. But he goes, let me tell you why we had all these failures. And in Psalm 78, one through eight, he tells the people of Israel why it was that they did not succeed as a nation. And these, these I think, could be crossed over to us as why we are not succeeding in the church age. And particularly as we have this mystery, this gospel from Christ to impart to other generations, this is the reason that we fail to do it if we are indeed feel like failures. So here it is, Psalm 78, and uh, that's enough of an introduction. So let's dive in. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old. Now, When he says, I'm going to utter dark sayings from old, he's not saying these are things that you haven't heard. He goes, these are just things that you've put in the dark. These are the things that that they've been said time and time and time again, but yet we just, we fail to do them. We struggle with that. Matter of fact, if you look at verse three, he says, these are things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Now, what's a really important key is, is that Israel is not disobedient because they didn't pass on some knowledge. And we're going to touch upon that in just a little while because you can pass on knowledge. But he goes, we heard these things. Like God has given us his word. He's given us his law. We've been faithful to teach it. Our parents have said something about it. We just have, have not done these things. We have failed to do them. And so he gives a commission in verses four and following. And I want you to see the six things that he's going to encourage them to do. And I think things are that we, just, we can use. In verse four, he says, we will not hide these things from 
their children. Like our goal is to remember the dark sayings of old, these utterings, this word of God. He goes, we need to remember these and then we need to tell them to the coming generation of the glorious deeds. You can underline the next three things. Underline the glorious deeds of the Lord. We're gonna tell about his might, underline that, and also tell about the wonders that he's done. And so here's the deal. If you and I are gonna be mission-minded as a family, number one in your preeminence is that God has to be the center of all that you do. Like he has to be the reason that you exist. He has to be the reason that you're here. Like if you're here today for any other reason than to quest after God, maybe it's our own personal journey. You're trying to figure out if God is real and if he's true, we're, we're glad to have you here. And we pray that you would come to see the glory and the divine hope that he offers through his son, Jesus. But if you go, I already have a hold of that divine truth. And listen to me, you have a reason to make sure he's preeminent in all things. You have a reason to make sure that he's at the center of who you are. That he's the center of why you exist. And I think that's a real struggle for most of us. I think in some ways we would say that with word, but not in deed. For, so in instance, for what I'm saying is in form, we're fine. Like in form, we say the right things, but in function, we do the wrong things. That I think is the classic American family, is the classic pastor that stands in the pulpit on Sundays across the nation. In form, they say the right things. Matter of fact, their people say amen. They, they love that. They are encouraged. But their children say, that's not what our function looks like at home. And so I want you to realize that Christ and God should be at the very center of all things. Why? Because God is the ultimate being. He is in reality all things. Created all things by him and for him. He is God. He is unchanging, he is immovable, he is constant, he remains the same. He is faithful in the midst of our unfaithfulness. He is good in the midst of our problems. He is the God who never leaves nor forsakes. He is the God who never makes mistakes in creation or otherwise. And so we need to realize that. Colossians 1 gives us a good glimpse of who God is. I want you to just, uh, to, we'll put it for you on the screen or you could turn there, but in Colossians chapter 1, if you look at verses 15 and following, it just says this about him, Christ, the Godhead. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created. That means you, that means me, that means the world in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Things you can't see, things you don't even know about. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I don't know if y'all realize this, but I bring this scripture up about 22 weeks of the year. Why? Because you need to realize who's preeminent in our lives. It is God. Everything is made by him and for him. Visible, invisible, thrones, powers, authorities, all things bow to him. He is the center of all things. You exist because of him. Time and function exist because of him. All things are made by him and through him. And then it goes on and it says in verse 17, and he is before all things. I mean, the only beginning you know is because he began it. The reason that there is space and time is because he entered into it. All things exist before him. All things are held together by him. Verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead that everything might be preeminent. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's the God that desires to be the center of your life. That is the God that desires to be the center of your home. That is the God that we claim here in leadership is the center of our church. He is preeminent in all things. If he wants to, by his sovereignty, close the doors of this church tomorrow, then by God's grace, we would be willing to do that. Because when we want to be a church on purpose, on mission, following one that's preeminent in our lives, he's the center of all things. But I want you to realize that as... Asaph goes on. He talks about the glorious deeds of the Lord, his mind, his wonders that he's done. You can't, you can't miss the verse, first part of verse five. And he goes, after you've talked about all that God has done, his glorious deeds, his power, his might, you need to realize that he established a testimony in Jacob and he appointed a law in Israel. So once you realize who God is and what he's done, you need to realize that he hadn't left you out in this crazy abyss by yourself. But he appointed something in, in Jacob, and he also gave the law in Israel. Now, the law there is a word that you would have as, as Torah is what it means. It literally means God's instruction to the people, which is the first five books of the Bible, the law. 
And so that, that's what that means. He goes, I, I'm giving a testimony in Jacob, but he goes, I'm also giving a law in Sinai to Moses. And Moses is going to give this to the people, and this is going to govern you. And so here's what I want you to hear this. And I think if there's anything else I'll say today that you should hear, it should be this. You cannot claim that God is the center of your life if, if the word is not central in your life. Every fundamental problem in your marriage, in your parenting, in your business, all comes back down to this one thing. Is the word of God central in your life? And it baffles me how many people I sit down with and we're talking about their marriage and they go, I just, I just like give us a few tips, like help us. And in some ways they hope that I'll have like seven steps for a healthy and godly family. And I'm like, no, I've got a thousand of them. Paul says it this way. He says, there's everything in the word that pertains to life and godliness. You want to know why your, your wife is struggling to be, in a sense, following you and your lead? It's because you're a jerk. If I were to talk to you about how you look like Jesus, do you serve her well? Do you sacrifice your, your life for her? Do you give yourself up? That's the picture of Jesus. Men, that's the standard in which we live to. Are you doing that well? You go, I don't have obedient children. And the reason why is because you're not faithful to them. You're not faithful to shepherd them. And that's what God's calling you to do. And wives, what are you? You're the bride of Christ. You're a picture of faithfulness and purity. You look at your relationship and you're not married and you go, okay, I got a, a boyfriend that doesn't look like Jesus and I'm sleeping with him as an unfaithful bride. You tell me, is that gonna work? No. It won't. It's going to end every time. And if it doesn't end now, it's liable to end 15 years from now. And here's the deal. As a shepherd, as a pastor, that's what I'm trying to pastor someone to. 15 years from now, in a marriage, we go back 18 years earlier and we see an unfaithful bride that's not pure and noble and is not what? The bride of Jesus. You think that's going to cause problems down the road? And the answer is yes. Now here's the good news. By God's grace, if you center yourself on his word, then not only can he restore you to what's been broken, not only can he bring about healthy forgiveness, but he can take something that's been really scrambled and out of place and he can use it to not only bring about comfort in your lives, but comfort in many others' lives. That's, that's what God's done here at Stone Point. Through the centrality of God's word in people's lives, people have been convicted, they've changed, and as a result, God's been the center of their life and you've seen some narratives take place that you go, that's only from God. And that's what it's about. Amen? And so the goal is not to beat you up today and go, man, you're such a failure. The, get, the deal is to see God's faithfulness in the midst of your failures. That if you'll turn to him, if you'll run to him, if you'll embrace him, the centrality of who he is in your life and who he is in, your, in the word, then you'll know and understand a God who can transform your family and can transform your life and put you on mission for something that lasts far beyond this life. That's the goal. Amen? And so it just says, he goes, he established his testimony. He, he gave you this word. But parents, you're not going to be effective in your parenting if you never abide in the word. I mean, John chapter 15, I, I think is very clear. Jesus says, hey, if a man remains in me, what, what, what does he say? He goes, the father is divine and we're the branch. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from him, he can do nothing. So the vine is not just some mythical God out there who you hope to have a feeling towards. But it's a God who is present, who created all things, both visible and invisible, and he has showed himself clearly through the word that became flesh, dwelt among us, then left us the Holy Spirit to live in our lives, and then he gives you a visible, tangible word which you can read and understand, and yet the church does not do this in by and large. And so you want a central family on God and his purposes, you need to know his word. It should be the center of your lives, the center of your teaching, is the fundamental thing that you and I have for our children. Grandparents, you go, I miss it with my children. It's the fundamental thing that you have for your grandchildren. You go, I just struggle to know what that looks like. Well, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like the sun in our solar system. Everything revolves around it and it illumines and gives light and darkness. If there is no sun, we're in darkness, Right? Now, let me tell you what that's like. I had a calf out last night at like 10 o'clock. I got a message to preach the next morning. And we're trying to find a black calf in the middle of midnight darkness. You know how frustrating that is? I'm like, Lord, just give me some light. 
And here come all my neighbors with their trucks, right? Like, finally. Trying to find hope in darkness is a lost cause. But when you have light that illumines, there's grace and there's sufficiency. That's what the word is. And I want you to realize something real quickly, okay? Imparting the word and instruction to your family through the word and illumining it in our lives, it does mean that you and I consume it. Like we ought to be reading it daily. If you skip a day, okay, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about a deep abiding with Jesus. But as it transfers over to your life, I want you to realize that it doesn't mean that in order for you to be effective in parenting, that you have to have a devotional every single night, two coloring pages, some 15-minute plan, scripture memory. Like that's not what it looks like, and that's why so many of you aren't doing it. You think, if I don't do it the way that I think maybe I have it in my mind, or maybe the way I hear the pastor doing it, I must be a failure. No, we don't have devotionals every night. But I can tell you this, when we watch um, a, a cartoon, and it has to do with the Decepticons and Optimus Prime, we help them realize the Decepticon was once good and he failed. And now there's good and evil. Now let me tell you about the one who is good and the one who fell. And you bring it right back down to scripture and you have a great narrative. It's an opportunity that when you got your kids in the school and our horrific traffic in the mornings here, you know you're gonna be late. You know you got them in the car for what you hope's 10, but it really is 20 or 25 minutes. Then why not say, you know what? What day of the month is it? Huh, it's the 25th. Okay, great. Let's turn to Proverbs 25. Let me tell you, let me just read a little bit of Proverbs 25 to you. For every day of the month, there's a proverb. You go, hey, we're in the car. It's, it's the seventh day of the month. Let's turn to Proverbs 7. Listen, do you know how much Proverbs 7 has to do? Hey, Proverbs 3. Hey, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him that he may make your path. Listen, son. You have anything that doesn't always make sense? Yeah, Dad, you don't make sense to me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, man, I understand. Let me confess that to you, man. You, you go and you watch this incredible new movie called Wonder about a boy who obviously is going to be picked on because of some abnormalities. But they go, you know what? Let me talk to you about what we just saw. Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God doesn't make mistakes with people. And then you bring it to the practical point of not only seeing the value of a human life, but also that regardless of race or color, do you realize how many things this brings up to talk about? That's table talk. That's biblical instruction. It is not the family that sits around and inform every single night does a 15-minute devotional, and then the other 23 hours and 45 minutes of, of the day, they do not function the way that God wants. It's functioning all the time on mission, revolving yourself around the God of the universe and the word that should be conforming you to his image. Amen? I think I could stop right there, but Asaph doesn't, and neither will I, okay? <clears throat> and so he goes on, and he says, you take this, this appointed law in Israel, this word of God, this instruction, and he says, and, and we, we're commanded that our fathers would teach that to their children. Do you see that? It's to take the word and it's to teach them. That's the idea of teaching. And so it's the testimony of your family to, to show what God has done. That's, that's what's so awesome. That's why this conversation that I had this last Tuesday with my parents was so incredible to me. Because all it was is, let me tell you what God has done. I grew up in a broken home. My dad didn't even walk me down the aisle. He wasn't present in my life. He died when I was in my early 30s. To hear my dad, he go, yeah, I, I, I became a Christian. And he goes, but I've had tons of hardships. My, my parents were killed in a car accident when I was 33. Landed a head coaching job. I was fired when I was 40. But to, to bring back to the centrality of the word and to use those moments, even now, as I'm 36 years old and my parents are still teaching me, that's what it's about. It never stops. You continue to teach. You continue to, to share what God has done. And that's the idea. You pass on what God has done. Tell the God stories. Be willing to be real enough 
to, to show your failures. It baffles me how many parents right now that if you would talk about your failures in dating, how that would encourage your kids. To go, I'm not just telling you to do this. I'm telling you that we did it wrong. And by God's grace and by his mercy, he allowed us to be transformed after we got married. And this is why we're so bent on you doing it right. It's because we don't want you to have the the life lessons that we had. Now, I'll tell you that if you're going to go your way, you need to know that I'm going to give you over to that. That's Romans 1. Proverbs 1 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Like if you don't want to fear the Lord and you don't want to heed the knowledge and the instruction of the counsel of God, if you want to Psalm 1, sit in the company and the seat of mockers and sinners, then I'll give you over to that. But I'm telling you why I don't want you to do that is because I've been there to talk about those things. I've been there, but let me tell you what God has done. Let me tell you how how he changed my life and the narrative of my story. Do you realize that's how a family tree has changed? It's not, hey, let's go to church and let's pretend we got this whole thing together. Get in the car, shut up, look good. Don't say anything negative to anybody. No, I'll tell you that as I teach my kids and they grow in knowledge, it means that I get called out more often. Understand? So just this last few days, Brady goes, hey, Dad, I need to talk to you. I go, okay, dude, whatever, man. I'll go in there. And he goes, hey, I got four things to tell you. I'm like, four? (laughs) He goes, Dad, number one, he goes, I I need you to know that I love you. I said, I love you too, buddy. And he goes, okay, now number two and three, okay? And he goes, and he kind of smiles because he he knows that, he knows that he should say it, but he's like, okay, how is Dad going to respond here? You know, like, I want... (laughs) And he goes, hey, I, I got to be honest with you, Dad. He goes, two or three things. And he goes, I love you. And he goes, number two, though, he said, you said something earlier to a lady that I thought was harsh. And he goes, and, and he goes I, I think you really need to think about that. And he said, Num- number three, he said, here's why you need to think about it. He goes, what if you were her? How would that make you feel? And he goes, Dad, number four, you need to know that I, I forgive you and I love you. <laughs> Now, you go, well, why in the world does he do that? And here's why. Because when he's a bonehead, then he has to come in front of our family and he has to repent for it. And he has to go, hey, listen, I I lost self-control. And he's had to do that a couple of times lately. I've lost self-control. I said some things that I shouldn't have said in my anger. I made a mockery of what what I'm taught. And guys, I just need your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And we go, yeah, you're forgiven but you also have consequences for your actions. And and listen, it comes from the basis of the word, teaching. You teach, and you're you're always teaching what God has done. If he's the central part of your life, it revolves around his teaching, his word, and you impart that to your peeps. Got me? Amen? That doesn't seem all that difficult, does it? I hope you get some practical things. And then here's where it gets out of your control. Because look what Asaph says. If you look at the, the latter part of you, you got five, you got this testimony appointed the law of Israel. And then he goes, and it's commanded to teach our children. Then go to six. He said that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. The reason that you teach is so that your children might know the teaching, that they would grow in knowledge. Now, here's what I want you to understand, is that you have very little control over a child's growth and knowledge. Do you understand? Like, I'll get up here every weekend and I'll teach as faithfully as I can. But I cannot impress God's word on sheep that are hell-bent on doing their own thing. I do not control the knowledge that you acquire. With what you take with this information, my faithfulness to God to impart it is done. And what you go from there is up to you. You have to take the knowledge. It's the same with your children. It's the same with your neighbor. It's the same with your coworker. All you can do is share. You can share the centrality of God in your life, the message of the hope of the gospel, his word that gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness, and you can teach it faithfully. And from there, it's out of your hands. That's it. Now, I'll tell you, I think there's some responsibilities in helping them grow in knowledge. I mean, obviously, you're teaching about it. One thing that just has nothing to do with this is kind of a plug for education is that one of the greatest responsibilities in teaching 
and helping them grow in knowledge that, that you would teach your children to read. And, and if that is a, a, a Dr. Seuss book, whatever it be, like teach your children to read because there's going to be a day and when they're able to read and maybe you said everything you know to say and finally God gets a hold of them and they read something for themselves that they grow in knowledge. And so I want you to realize it's not just, you know, telling me all about the Bible. Like there's some responsibilities to parents to teach. And as we're teaching and we're training, then we hope that they grow in knowledge. And as they grow in knowledge, here's the key. As they grow in knowledge, two fundamental things happen. And this is the key of the message, okay? Although I think it's all fantastic. The children yet on board would arise and they would tell their children. And then look what it goes on. And in verse seven, latter part, so that they would set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. The reason you teach and you hope they acquire it through knowledge is that they would set their hope in God. Do you realize, moms, how many teenage girls right now, if they had their hopes set in God, how many things that would protect them from? How many identity issues right now in a world that says they're not enough? Do you know if they had their identity, what it would look like for them to be godly young men at the age of 15 or 16, to be respectful, to be noble, to not be pursuing dishonest gain, but to be pursuing things that God desires? Like, what, Do you realize what that looks like? If they grow in knowledge and then they set their hope in God, it changes everything for them. And so the goal is that they would be set, that their confidence in God would be sure. That even if they look at their bodies and they go, I struggle to like myself, that there's a part of you that you go, your confidence is God. God didn't make a mistake with you. You're not dumb. You're not stupid. You're not ugly. You're beautiful. God has a purpose for you here. And I know that you're wrestling with that purpose. And I'm praying that God would help set a hope in you that's deep and profound. That when everybody else in your class is, is out pursuing their purpose, that God would set it sure and steadfast in your life, that you would know that your purpose isn't more friends, that your purpose isn't in the most beautiful, that it's not in the most handsome, that it's not in the most likable. And I'll tell you, I think it's a struggle for us. And so for in our home, we got one child that, and he, he, he does, he struggles to learn. And so we're always having to remind ourselves that, man, if, if, he, if he makes a C to the best of his ability and to God's glory, then I'm okay with C. I never pump A's or B's, I don't care. But I do want you to do everything with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind for the glory of God. I have a beautiful little girl. And you know what my greatest prayer for her is that God would impress upon her, her life that outward beauty is fleeting. That your hair being adorned and that you uh, being spectacular in that way is not what impresses God, but God's impressed with the inward beauty. So you want them to set their hope and their confidence on God and his word, the things that you're teaching them. Got me? And here's why. Because as they set their hope and their confidence in God, then something else happens. And that is, if you look, verse seven, the very last part of it, they'll keep his commandments. They'll be obedient to God. Now, let me explain something to you real quickly, and I'm gonna kind of wrap it all up. Do you know what obedience to God does? It protects you from a lot of stupid decisions. Understand? Matter of fact, that's how he, he ends it in verse eight. Verse eight is just a reminder of why you should be obedient and keep God's commands. He goes, so that you wouldn't be like your fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. I mean, if that sums you up as a dad, a stubborn, hard-hearted man, your spirit's not faithful to God, boastful, prideful, that's most likely what you're going to impart to your children. And if you impart that to your children, I can tell you, they're going to have a very difficult life. Pride never brings about anything but a destructive fall. And so I just want you to realize that that's why we do it. Now, real quickly, has that been good stuff? Amen? Like, let me just kind of wrap up with something else that I think is really important for us to note, okay? And that is, okay, if we know like why we should do this and, and what it should bring about in our lives, like the goal is fruit, right? Fruitfulness in our lives. And the question is like, where do we go and how do we do it? I hope you got some of the how, but one thing I want you to realize what Jesus did with the early church is that he commissioned them to be, be something on mission. 
And I want you to realize that I think there's a couple of fallacies that are happening in the local church about on mission. Because if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, then Jesus is going to talk to his disciples. And he's just going to basically say (coughs) what it looks like to to be on mission. And he goes, hey, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then he goes, what? Once it's come upon you, you're going to go and you're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to do that in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, he's basically saying that I want you to go and I want you to make a difference for the cause of gospel. And it's going to go everywhere. Now, think about your family for just a second. We're going to take this, and in context, we're going to use it for our family. Think about you just for a second. If your family is kind of the hub, Jerusalem, then it's really easy to kind of get centered there. But Jesus goes, I want you to go Jerusalem, Judea. They didn't have a real problem with Judea, but Judea is out from Jerusalem. They're going to have to go somewhere. And then he goes, Samaria. Now, Samaria is the place that if you're an American, you're likely to say, why don't we just drop a bomb on them and blow them all up and let God sort it out? That sort of thing, which is really highly unbiblical. And the reason it's highly unbiblical is because Jesus is concerned as much about that person as he is any. Regardless of color, ethnicity, or religious beliefs, Jesus wants to pursue them all. And oftentimes, I think in our American culture, we do. And I'm not demeaning our flag and our soldier or anything, but if Jesus and God are preeminent in our lives and we're grounded in the scripture, then we realize that all lives matter, right? So we even got to go to places like Samaria, places that make us highly uncomfortable. We got to have conversations that make us uncomfortable with people that make us uncomfortable. Why? Because God's in pursuit of them too. And then around the world. Do you see this? Now here's the struggles. I think the fallacies that happen. We don't mind keeping our family in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, I think it happens in in the local church a lot. So what I mean by that is you get a family and they go, we love God's word and we love what God's doing in our life and we're just gonna kind of protect our family. And so basically you just take an umbrella and you put it on your family and you just do everything you can in your power to protect them. And that means that you're not gonna expose them to places like Judea and Samaria. And you're fearful of what it would look to go to the other ends of the earth because you, you protect your family. And if that's your mindset, then I want you to realize that that's idolatry. Because Jesus didn't give you family to protect them. Matter of fact, he goes, those who want to love me might hate their family. And he's just trying to give you an intense statement there saying that, look, I'm preeminent in all things. And if I'm preeminent in all things, it means you got to be willing to leave your mother, your father, your sister, and your brother and follow me. And so I want you to realize that being on mission is to love your family well, to train them up, It is all of these things. It is to allow God to be the center. The word is central to what you do. You teach that. They grow in knowledge. They set their hope in God. And they what? Become obedient. That's huge. But as they're obedient in the scriptures, I want you to realize there's never a New Testament disciple that's obedient to God and the central part of their lives who stays where he is. It does not happen. That is an American concept. I'll pray for you as you go on missions. No. No. We're always on missions, which I think is, brings up the other fallacy. Here's the other fallacy. The other fallacy is, is that we're on missions if we go to the other part of the world. And that's why I hesitate to call them mission trips. And the reason why is because if you go around the world and you share the gospel and you get on that team of people in your church and they come back and they go, oh my goodness, man, you're not going to believe oh Sam, Dude, he was killing it. He was spreading the word. People were getting saved. And I go, dude, I've never seen Sam do that here. That's a problem. So here's what I want you to realize. Missions is not something you do. It is something you are. And if you think I'm going to go across the world and I'm going to get an ooey-gooey feeling and I'm going to share the gospel with someone and you don't share it with your own kids or your neighbors or the black person or the poor person, dude, we're missing it. Because last time I checked, man, some of the people that are invested most in the kingdom of God here are a lot of different colors. And I praise God for their work, and I praise God for their families. And I praise God for what he's doing. But I'll tell you, God says he wants us to take the gospel the least of these. And so don't draw a bubble around your family and, and throw, throw yourself on it. But more, impart truth to your family, and then listen to this, unleash them to go do a greater work than you've ever done. Isn't that why Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit 
and I'm going to allow him to invest in the lives of people, and I'm going to see greater works than you've ever seen in my ministry. Jesus believed that the greatest works of the kingdom of God would happen through the church age and not even his ministry. How does it happen? When you live a life on mission, regardless of where you go. Amen? And guys, if you don't have something to discuss, you weren't listening. I love you, and it is a pleasure to serve as our pastor here. Let me pray for us, and then we're gonna close. God, we love you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace that abides in our life. God, I thank you that even when I'm a bonehead, God, even when I didn't do things right, that God, by your sovereign grace, you you adjusted the pattern of my life towards you. And God, I I am the first to confess up here that God, that I, I don't always abide in you. I don't always impart the word to my family the way I should. I don't always live on mission. God, I'm thankful for your word and the constant reminder from people around me of what it is that you called me to. And God, I just pray that we wouldn't settle in on this American dream for something less than what you've called us to. God, I pray that the people here in this church and this building at this present time, that God, they would realize that there is so much more to gathering as the people of God than just one Sunday and one hour. But Lord, there are people who you have put in our lives to not only encourage us and to strengthen us, to admonish us, to rebuke us sometimes, but most of all, so that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. And God, I want nothing more than you. For me and for my family, for my kids, and for this church. And God, don't, help, don't allow us to settle for anything less. God, we love you. We thank you that you're patient with us and that you're patient with the world right now that no one would perish and no one would spend an eternity without you. And so God, would you help us to go on mission? And may it start in Jerusalem, in our families, but God, would it spread quickly to, to Judea and Samaria, the difficult places and around the world, wherever it is that you take us, God, may we be the church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.